Hi, I'm Jonathan Colopy from Your Why, and welcome to the Why Be Well podcast. Uh, my guest today is Michael Samanchik from the Innocent Center. Michael, uh, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. So as I understand, Michael, you've been involved with pursuing innocence for throughout your professional career. So if you wouldn't mind, give me a sketch of uh, what you've been involved in. Sure. Uh, I got uh, involved first at the California Innocence Project back in 2008. I was uh, just a baby law student, and uh, I heard about the California Innocence Project when an individual came to the law school named Timothy Atkins. He had been in prison for 23 years for a crime he didn't commit. Hmm. I was 23 years old, and so he had spent my entire life in prison for a crime he, he didn't do. And he said that there were thousands more just like him. And that he needed, they all needed assistance in getting out. And so that was kind of my moment to sort of dive into this. So I became a student in 2008. I was a, a, a student in the clinic for a year, and then I was a staff attorney, and then I became managing attorney. And I just finished up there about two weeks ago and launched the Innocence Center. So in the Innocence Center, is the focus going to be a little bit different or what, what would you say? The focus is still going to be on getting innocent people out of prison, but it's going to be more focused on the investigation and the litigation, uh, trying to bring on more investigators, more lawyers, and expanding the scope, where in my previous role, I was focusing primarily on Southern California. The Innocent Center is going to focus nationally and even taking on some international work if it comes our way. That's fantastic. And as you you know laid out there, you definitely would need greater resource to be able to have a reach like that. So are you partnering with different organizations or foundation supported and private donors? How, how do you accomplish that? There's a couple of federal grant resources that we're going to pursue. And there's also a bunch of private donors that are interested in the work we're doing and interested in being a part of trying to free the next group of innocent people from prison. Wow, that, that's fantastic. But Mike, let's go back. You had just shared, you know, when you were starting in law school and, and you encountered that particular individual and, and understood his case and took that on. Obviously, that was a, a pivotal moment in your professional career because that has launched you forward. Uh, share with me, you know, because I'm not literate in this space, wrongful con convictions. What's the prevalence of this? How often does it happen? Great question. So I, I mean, back when I was first exposed to it, I probably, I think we were, we're probably uh, similarly minded in, in the sense that I didn't think it was this massive problem. Uh, I, I had seen Shawshank Redemption and thought like, okay, so it's like once in a blue moon sort of thing. Realistically, looking at our our criminal legal system, I think it's probably somewhere between five and ten percent of every criminal conviction hmm. is an innocent person. So in California, to put that in perspective, we have 100,000 people sitting in prison right now. So on a conservative estimate, there's probably 5,000 of those individuals that are innocent and locked up. But some studies suggest it could be as high as 10,000 just in the state of California. And as we look out nationally and we look to places that have fewer resources, so we're looking at places that where the public defender's office, for example, doesn't have as many resources as a place like San Diego. Uh, as the, uh, you know, the the prosecutors or the police might not have as many resources to do an adequate investigation, then I would expect that the problem could be greater. And, and the same is true even on the level of a case that you're talking about. So in a death penalty case, you typically have some of the most resources, the most seasoned lawyers, the most seasoned judges, most seasoned investigators. But as you go down in, in, the, in the severity of the crime, the level of resources given to a particular type of crime goes down. You have more junior lawyers working on it. You have newer investigators working on it. Mm -hmm. So I would expect that the problem would go up as the, the severity of the crime goes down. So there's probably even a greater number of innocent people sitting in jail for the lower level offenses than there are in prison. But for us, it's really hard to capture that because by the time we would get an investigation done and get them out, 
they've already been released from prison or jail. Well, from jail on the shorter ones. You're like pulling the curtain back there. And I'm still like <laughs> stunned by some of those statistics that you just shared. Okay. Uh, the prevalence of, you know, five to 10%. That is, that's stunning. Uh, and so, my, you know, I've always had just, uh, you know, belief in the legal and justice system and had no reason to question it. Uh, I think there's been more uh, awareness of some of the injustices more recently. Uh, but how does that come about? I can't believe it's malicious. I mean, you spoke to uh, resource issues, but help me understand what are the what are the causes for these wrongful convictions? If if you're able to kind of say this is why it comes about. Yeah, I mean, we're actually kind of lucky in the sense that a couple of years ago, maybe it's been 10 now, um, the net, there's there was the creation of this thing called the National Exoneration Registry. And so it, it collects all of the information that we've seen on wrongful conviction cases going back to 1989. And so what that allows us to do is look at each and every wrongful conviction that's happened, take a look at why it happened, and then try to quantify where are the biggest problems. And so there's been 30, about 3,300 wrongful convictions documented since 1989. And we've seen that, you know, in about 12% of those cases, there was a false confession. So that doesn't sound like a big number, but that's 330 people that falsely confessed to a crime they didn't commit. That's an interesting t statistic, especially when you look at, at, at the types of cases that are there and you, and you think like, well, I would never falsely confess. Well, there's people in that registry that are just like you and me that have mm. falsely confessed. Wow. There's other things like eyewitness misidentification that happen in about a fifth of the cases where a person thinks they see something see a person, they think, you know, a witness that makes an identification of a perpetrator that committed a crime and they get it wrong. And that happens quite often, actually. And we've, thankfully, we've been lucky enough to have DNA evidence in a number of cases to be able to help prove those scenarios. But DNA has really kind of put a spotlight on all other aspects of the criminal legal system and highlighted where there have been problems as well. So um, we've kind of been fortunate that forensic science has come along to um, point the finger at the at the problems. Well, I want to start with you. You spoke to uh, false confession, and yeah. and with that, I'm aware uh, of some of more of the sensational cases where you see people that have been uh, in a situation where there's you know duress uh, and interrogation goes on and on. And in some ways, it seems almost you know some of the tactics utilized don't seem right, at least what I've seen more sensationally. So, so help me understand how a false confession may come about in your professional experience. Sure. I mean, so often um, the way it starts is a law enforcement will pull a person into a room. That room is, is intentionally set up to make a person feel like they can't leave, even if they, they are free to leave under the law. Uh, and the entire interrogation is kind of set up to intimidate and to make a person feel like their only way out of this is by working with the police and whatever that and and whatever that means and and you know from like the way that the chair is designed to the way the table set up and everything is kind of set up in a way that the person feels like they don't have any power and they don't Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest things, one of the biggest problems, and and certainly some law, some states and, and lawmakers have started to recognize this, but one of the biggest things that uh, we do that I think results in false confessions is employing deception. When police can go and lie and say that there's evidence that you committed a crime when that that's not true. And I'll give you an example. Say that you and I are sitting in an interrogation interrogation room and I tell you I'm investigating a, a murder case and I just found your DNA, Jonathan, under the fingernails of the person that that is, that was found dead. Wow, that that, is, that, that, that seems... could be entirely false. So that's a very interesting example that you brought forward. Yeah, so your DNA is under some fingernails and you've done it. Now you you might sit there across from me and say like there's no way. Like I know for a fact I didn't participate in this. Like I had nothing to do with this. I don't even know this person. And the investigator says, "Well, come on, Jonathan." Or I'll say, "Come on, Jonathan. Your DNA's there. The DNA doesn't lie." And we spend hours going round and round saying, "Look, I have the evidence. The evidence is here, and the evidence says you did it." And then I start saying, well, maybe, Jonathan, maybe you just don't remember. Maybe you had uh, one of those moments where you you blacked out. 
And now you start thinking, maybe I did just black out. Maybe I can't recall actually doing it. Yeah. And, and you know, so if could, that goes on for a particular duration, I could see how someone would start to question their own reality. I'm just questioning your tactic there, Mike, in terms yeah. of is that just, is that legal? That's totally legal. And some states now it's illegal to, to use deception when you're speaking to minors. Okay. Uh, okay. And that's, that's the extent of the limitation there. Now in, in the UK, they can't lie. And, you know, they still solve crimes and they still do interviews and interrogations, but they don't, they don't lie. They don't use deception. And I, I actually think it's an interesting thing. If you're in a, if you're in, in an interview with the FBI and you lie to the FBI, that itself is a federal crime. But if you flip the script and the FBI lies to you, that's okay. Interesting. So the question is why, right? Yeah. So my hope is that, that some of the work that you do and others hopefully uh, uh, puts safeguards in place for people so that we're not uh, at such a high rate of wrongful conviction, especially under the circumstances that you spoke of. Yeah. And of course, like, you know, a lot of people are probably sitting there like, I will never break down. I'll just, you know, I, I will never falsely confess. And and there are, a, there's a group of people that will probably never come around to falsely confessing, but there are folks that um, are more susceptible to suggestibility. Mm. And it's those individuals we absolutely need to protect. And typically those are people that are younger. So under the age of 25, those are people that have um, perhaps, you know, their IQ is a, a little bit lower than average, then you're going to see a higher higher rate of a false confession. So um, it, it kind of just depends on the person. But I would I would venture a guess to say that uh, a seasoned, talented interrogator could get anybody to falsely confess with the right lies. That, that, that's that's alarming. Uh, you, you spoke to some vulnerable populations there. Are there others that are more common as victims of wrongful wrongful conviction? Well, I mean, we typically see people, uh, minority members getting uh, wrongfully convicted and then, and people without resources. And, okay. you know, that's, you know, that it, it kind of just depends. But um, if you look at the vast majority of the people that have been exonerated in the, in the registry, it's been people of color. Is there work being done to change that in some way? I mean, how do, how do we uh, address that? I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of a, it's a systemic change. It mm -hmm. has to be um, a thing that's addressed, not just uh, like, you know, we can handle it case by case, but there are bigger things that we can do. I mean, just doing um, eyewitness identification reform and making sure that the way that we conduct lineups and we don't have, um, you know, we use a double a double blind procedure, for example. So the officer that's conducting the lineup doesn't know who the suspect is. And the purpose there is that the what has happened in the past and sometimes still does happen is that the officer will point to the even, you know, not even knowing it, unknowingly kind of try to assist a witness in picking the person they think did it, hmm. not the person the witness thinks did it. Sure. And that little bit of encouragement might send them down the wrong path. So stuff like that, that can, that can change. I mean, filming interrogations. So we can see if an interrogator provided some secret information, only the killer might know. And then the, mm. that suspect then repeats it back. It's like, well, they got the information from you 25 minutes ago. So of course mm. they knew that. Um, and then recording the eyewitness identification procedures. So we, we can actually see how those things unfold. Cause otherwise, you know, when I go back and try to talk to a witness that made an identification 25 years ago, sure. they'll say, oh, well, the officer tapped on a photo and said, take another look at number two. Hmm. Um, if that would have been recorded, maybe the, the entire thing doesn't happen at the trial level. But yeah. now, 25 years later, I'm supposed to try to convince a judge that that's how it happened. And that's the only reason the witness went that way. And you can see how, you know, just certain personalities are more lent to uh, wanting to please by, you know, doing the right thing. They, maybe that officer or the interrogator knows something I don't. So let me, let me give the right answer per se. Um, but, but you alluded to, you know, once there's the wrongful conviction, uh, I have to assume that it's pretty difficult to overturn something. Oh yeah. And our system was built on that, which I'm, you know, I don't know that that was right from the start. We've kind of built the system on finality 
which is like we have to respect what a jury has has found. And I, I get that. I get the idea that like, oh, the jury, we have to respect this this decision by the jurors, but information changes, science, forensic science changes, and new information comes along that maybe a jury didn't have an opportunity to consider. And, you know, we have to take this new information into consideration and try to look back. I think the best way to do it is look back and try to say, if the jurors, if even one juror would have changed their mind, would it have changed the out? It would have changed the outcome in this case, and mm -hmm. that's kind of the way I would think you should look at it, as opposed to, you know, d trying to be a judge taking all of the information and in now and making your own call as the single juror. Look back and say, if this would have changed the minds of one of the old jurors, perhaps we should have a, a new trial and let yeah. a new jury make that that decision. Don't be afraid of reversing and sending it back. Uh -huh. you, you you raise an interesting point. I mean, I think about our our society is really established on this con construct of having faith in the justice system. And so you're you're raising some questions there. Uh, and so I wonder how we, as the public, has ha how do we instill faith again in the in the justice system? If we're gonna in a, continue in a checking balance, please. Yeah, I mean, if we're gonna continue to have this experiment with jurors, mm. then I think we have to do better like we can't we have to have some educational pieces for jurors before they go in uh you know because i i look back at some of these cases that i'm i'm involved in and you know i'm i'm not a scientist i mean understanding just the bare bones of dna like the the some i can't get into the nitty-gritty of dna uh mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not I, I i can understand it from a pretty high level, but um, getting into the nitty gritty, it's it's challenging. And I've spent you know more than a decade looking at DNA cases. If I were on a jury and I'd never been exposed to DNA, I can't imagine how listening to an expert for an hour would educate me enough to know how to make a call hmm. on, at a, on a trial and and with somebody's life in my hands as to whether they should go to prison for the rest of their life or they should be executed, right? Yeah. And same's true for, you know, if you're looking at like an arson investigation, for example, like I'm supposed to have this fairly in-depth understanding of how uh, fire science works based on an expert taking the stand for a few hours and telling me that, oh, well, based on these burn patterns, I think that the fire, there were ignition points here, here, and here. And therefore, because there's multiple ignition points, this was a human set fire. Yeah, And, uh, I, you know, I don't know if it's reasonable to have jurors try to come to that kind of a conclusion or that kind of understanding and then to make the ultimate conclusion that a person did or did not do something. Yeah, so it's, um, a, it's an interesting uh, uh, thought process that you're sharing there, because we're meant to be judged by a jury of our peers. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, then it's incumbent on uh, the attorneys involved in presenting to make sure that we're able to make an informed decision and each has a different investment hopefully the investment is in justice in right. that particular case right so mike michael share with me maybe a significant significant case that you were involved in that might be help helpful for us to kind of illuminate how you pursued innocence sure i'll talk about um the horace roberts case it's um, a case out of riverside california so um, if you've ever been up the 15, a little ways from San Diego, that's where, uh, that's where Riverside is. Okay. Um, uh, Horace was working at, uh, Quest Diagnostics in North County, San Diego. He had been working there for a number of years. Uh, he started to have, he had a wife and, and, uh, and some kids. He started to have an affair with a, a woman that he was working with. Um, subsequently that, uh, individual that he was having an affair with, she, uh, they had moved in together or they were carrying on this relationship and both their spouses found out about it. The woman that he was having the affair with was also married and had some kids too. Um, both of their spouses end up finding out about it. And, um, it's somewhat contentious between everybody. Um, uh, but they're going to try and kind of continue, uh, with their, their, this new relationship. Well, eventually, um, uh, Horace is supposed to be picked up by this woman and she doesn't show up and he doesn't know where whatever happened to her. And a few days later, she's found dead on the side of the 15 mm. freeway. And uh, Horace had lied about the having the affair at his work because he was supervising her and he wasn't allowed to have a relationship with people uh, that he was supervising. Uh, 
he uh, you know lied about uh, various other things that uh, you know I think were probably just like white lies that uh, with regard to the relationship. And so the police started to focus on him. Uh, they ended up finding a, a working stopwatch or a, um, a wristwatch next to her body. And they presented it to him. And after five hours of interrogation, had him convinced that it was, in fact, his watch. Mm -hmm. And so he said, all right, fine, you have my watch, but I didn't kill. I didn't kill her. Um, that was pretty much enough to get him convicted in 1999. And mm -hmm. so he went to prison, uh, went through the appeals process. And in 2004, he wrote to the California Innocence Project claiming his innocence. And uh, we got involved in uh, about a year or two later. And by 2007, we were uh, starting down the process of getting stuff DNA tested. And in 2011, when I was assigned to the case, we got DNA results that showed the DNA on the watch didn't belong to Horace. So we knew it wasn't, we knew it wasn't his watch, but we didn't know who it was. And, and so that was kind of the, the tough, the challenging part. Um, we did. So Mike, some... when you're pursuing innocence in this yeah. state or, or wrongfully convicted, how do you go about, is your focus to disprove the conviction are you, or is the intent to point towards who may have been the one that was uh, the perpetrator? In this case, it was to try to figure out what happened. I think in all cases, it's really, does in a, it's a search for the truth. Hmm. So when we did the DNA testing, if it would have come, if the watch would have come back to him, we would have been done, right? Yeah. Like we would have closed the case and it's like, all right, your watch is at the scene. How do we, we can't, you did it, right? Yeah. Um, and that's just not what happened here. So it was kind of like, okay, well, let's keep, Let's turn the next page. Let's see what else we can find. So we did an, an, another round of testing and ultimately uh, testing under her fingernails and on her jeans and on various different parts of her clothing revealed an unknown male profile that of uh, a person that was in CODIS, which is like a national database of offenders. And that person, I'd, I had never heard the name before. And so I, I quickly threw it into Facebook just to do like a quick search and see like, who is this individual? And it popped to the victim's estranged husband. Wow. As they were, wow. they were cousins. And I was like, oh, dang, got it. Um, and so then we, uh, you know, I went, I called the prosecutor and uh, six months later, they uh, agreed to release Horace Roberts and they made arrests of the, the uh, true perpetrators. And those, those individuals are facing, uh, facing how, how, a murder charge. Now. How long did uh, Horace spend? 20 and a half years. Got him out in 2018. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So well, that I really admire and appreciate the perseverance and, and truly the, the work that you're doing, Mike, uh, what what is your vision with the the Innocence Center that you're now the executive director of? I think you know the vision has always been how do we help out as many Horace Roberts as we can, right? Let's get as many of these innocent people out of prison because the the requests for assistance just keep coming. So it's we have to figure out a way to scale to grow and try to really provide the best legal assistance we can, and that's kind of the vision is. Let's make let's create something a lot larger that has more lawyers and more investigators that can go out and tend to all of these cases, find the innocent people, and let's get them out. And then I think there's the other the other parts of of the vision are you know to kind of fix the problem when it comes to the jury. If we can do enough public education, if we can teach the public that here are the problems with wrongful convictions, here's where we commonly see mistakes are made. Mm -hmm. Look for those if you're ever sitting on a jury. Talk to your friends and family so that if they're sitting on a jury, that we can have that, you know, we have that knowledge being spread from one to the other. Um, and then supporting the exonerated folks as they get out, because, mm -hmm. you know, as as people spend 20, 30 years in prison, often their friends, their family, they don't really have ties to the community. They don't have an income. They haven't worked for the last 20 years. They don't have a resume they can use to go get a job. So supporting the exonerated individuals to make sure that as they get back into society, they can actually succeed. Well, you, you've pointed to uh, you know three, three distinct areas that would make tremendous difference in terms of finding those that are wrongly convicted, uh, supporting them in the, in the process of having a, a jury trial that the jury is informed and educated, uh, and then also reintegration into society and community. Uh, that's something I think we owe that to people that have been wrongly convicted by our system. 
Mike, really, uh, Michael, really a pleasure to have time with you today. And uh, again, I greatly appreciate the, the work that you're doing and the difference that you're making in community. So I, I wish you uh, continued success and having uh, greater impact as you move forward. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And thanks for having me on. Thank you. And uh, all of you, until the next time we're together, please be well.